Thanks so much. It's great to be here tonight and great to see so many uh, faces in the audience, people I haven't seen for a long time. I'm very touched that you're here. Thank you. Um, I grew up in Arvada, uh, just uh, right near Stanley Lake. Uh, and like uh, many of the kids, my siblings and I, we rode our horses around in the fields around Rocky Flats and we swam in the lake. And we had no idea that it was a nuclear weapons uh, production facility, that they were producing plutonium pits for nuclear bombs. Over the course of about 40 years, they produced uh, more than 70,000 uh, plutonium triggers for nuclear weapons. We were unaware of that. Um, Dow Chemical uh, ran the plant when I was a kid, and the rumor in the neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. My mother thought that they were making scrubbing bubbles. Um, and it was interesting when I was doing um, the research for this book and I talked to so many people who grew up near Rocky Flats and there were lots of rumors like that. People thought that they were making oven cleaner or uh, glass doorknobs, you know, all sorts of different things. So it, was, it really had a mystique. I can say I've been honestly, say I've been thinking about Rocky Flats since I was about 11 years old. We could see the water tower from our back porch and we always wondered what it was and, and what went on out there. And then later, uh, like many of the kids in my neighborhood, I ended up working at Rocky Flats for a while uh, myself. And, um, and uh, then uh, the, the day that I, that I left Rocky Flats was a day that I decided that I would someday write a book about it. And uh, more than uh, 10 years of research and writing went in, into this book, so it's been a very, very long project. The book itself is a weave of investigative journalism and memoir. It's the story of what happened to me and my siblings and my neighbors uh, and many of the people that I knew growing up and also some of the workers and some of the activists. Uh, and then it's also the history of the plant itself, um, the very dramatic history as I'm sure many of you know. Um, from its very beginnings to the FBI raid in 1989, the only time I believe in the history of our country that two government agencies, the FBI and the EPA, have raided another agency. The plant was uh, owned by the Department of Energy. And then up to the present, you know, with the cleanup and, and a rather controversial cleanup and all the feelings that people have pro and con about, about that. So I wanted to give a very human uh, face to a story that is really an inhumane story in, in many ways. And I wanted to tell it in a very compelling way. I wanted the book to read like a novel. Uh, and yet it's very heavily footnoted, very heavily reset, researched and fact checked. So you can go to the back and, and look at footnotes and see where all this information came from. And I'm very grateful to all of the wonderful uh, local libraries, the Carnegie Library up in Boulder in particular, the Cold War Museum, the Oral Histories and all of that. Uh, and all the people that I interviewed myself, some of whom are in this room tonight, um, it all went into this book. So uh, it's been a long project. What I'd like to do, I think, is read to you from three different sections. And can you hear me all right? Is that, is that right? I want to give you a sense of, of the different voices in this book um, and, and the different experiences. Some of it is written in first person and has to do with my own experiences and the experiences of my family and then other parts come from different perspectives. I'm going to begin with um, the 1989 raid that was led by FBI agent John Lipsky on the plant. And um, I'm just going to read you just a little bit from this particular section. There's some good information about Rocky Flats in this section. And then I'm going to skip up uh, a little bit and read a small portion of, of when I was working at the plant myself. Uh, in that point in time, I was, I was a single parent. I guess this is the Silkwood part of the story. I, I was a single parent with two little kids, and I was putting myself through graduate school, and I worked at Rocky Flats myself, partly because um, it, was, it was a great job in a number of ways, and certainly considered to be a good job. And um, I was also very curious. I wanted to, it, Rocky Flats had always been such a great monolith to me, and I wanted to see what it was like to work there myself. And then I'm going to um, conclude with reading a section. I'm going to go back in time to 1969, um, to the fire. There were many fires at Rocky Flats, as I 
I'm sure many of you know, but there were two big fires, one in 1957 that was very uh, damaging, devastating fire, and then another in 1969. And the fire in 1969 happened right after uh, we moved out uh, closer to Rocky Flats. I spent my youngest years my younger years uh, in Old Arvada, we had a, one of those little houses in Old Arvada. We could still see Rocky Flats uh, from the back porch. But then we uh, bought a house, my parents built a house out in a subdivision called Bridaldale, which was much, clo much closer. Um, and that, that was right before that fire. So I'm gonna begin with this section that kind of leads up to the FBI raid. And this first sentence has to do with, I also talk quite a bit about some of the protests out at Rocky Flats, protests against the plant, and protests in favor of the plant, actually. So this first line refers to all the different kinds of people whose lives were affected by Rocky Flats in various ways. Nuns and hippies, housewives and physicists, attorneys and Buddhist monks, history makes for odd alliances. In 1987, two men from separate government agencies form an unlikely team. John Lipsky of the FBI's New Environmental Crimes Division and William Smith of the EPA's Na National Environmental Investigation Unit quietly begin to look into alleged abuses at Rocky Flats. They seem straight out of a Rocky Flats version of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but with a happier ending. Progress is slow. Lipsky, a former Las Vegas street cop who's not afraid of plutonium, the government, or hard work, has a casual demeanor, but he's been the lead investigator in 13 environmental cases. He's persistent. Years of secrecy and threats have made workers and activists alike very nervous around government types. No one wants to talk. Finally, after months of trying to build trust and convince people of his sincerity, Lipsky gets lucky. An activist gives him the name of Jim Stone. Stone has been waiting months, no decades, for a call like this. He loads up all his boxes. Jim Stone worked at Rocky Flats for quite a while and was fired from the plant. He loads up all his boxes and takes them down to the FBI's Denver office. A polite, slightly stout man wearing a fedora, Stone doesn't look much like a rabble rouser to Lipsky and Smith, but he has a story and he can't wait to tell it. Lipsky has few confirmed facts about contamination at Rocky Flats. But one thing he knows for sure is that the incinerator in Building 771 is supposed to be shut down. Yet he's heard numerous rumors that it's being operated illegally. Are they still burning plutonium out there? He asks Stone. Oh yeah, Stone replies. They have so much waste out there that they have to, they have to fire up that incinerator. I told them there are better ways that you don't have to do it that way. That incinerator is not protected with suitable filters. It's not even designed to burn common trash properly without causing air pollution. But they said, no, this is the most expedient. We're going to do it this way. Rockwell and, D and the DOE have always contended that the 771 incinerator is exempt from RICRA, RCRA, regulation because Rocky Flats is, quote, a plutonium recovery facility and thus granted an exclusion. How do you know these things, Lipsky asks. Both Lipsky and Smith are having a hard time keeping up with Stone. Stone has waited a long time to talk. Well, I worked in that building all the time, Stone says. The new incinerator, the fluidized bed incinerator, never did work. They've tried it a few times, but could never get it certified. There's a limit on how much hazardous and radioactive waste they can store, and they have no room for it, so they burn it. They burn waste contaminated with plutonium, low-level and medium-level waste. What else do you know, Smith asks. I can tell you about a lot of things, Stone replies. Stanley Lake, for example. Not only is there plutonium and americium and uranium and you name it, but I know by the stratus in the lake sediment when that contamination occurred. Lipsky looks over at Smith. They have their first source. A lot of contamination goes up the stack, the Building 771 incinerator smokestack, and into the environment, Stone continues, because the filters leak like a sieve. Like a sieve. The wind prevails from the west. It's the same thing with the groundwater, with Great Western and Stanley Lake just downhill, right on down to the Platte River. Denver is sitting at the gravity base of all this pollution coming down from Rocky Flats, and it has to be stopped at the source. He pauses. That's always an engineer's primary objective, determine the cause of the problem, get at the source, and correct it there. 
Stone tells Lipsky and Smith about his long history at Rocky Flats, about how he helped build the plant and knows the facility inside and out. Workers have inad inadequate protection, he says, but he also talks about how workers mess with or remove the filters sometimes because filters slow down production. He talks about how produ productivity tra trumps safety or environmental laws. There's a lot of plutonium missing, Stone adds, some in the ventilation ducts and piping, some blowing around outside. They blackballed me. The industry is spooky about whistleblowers, he says, but I don't see myself as a whistleblower. I see myself as a good engineer. With this ammunition in hand, Lipsky and Smith contact Ken Finberg, assistant U.S. attorney for the state of Colorado, and a Harvard-trained lawyer with a strong record in environmental issues. If Rocky Flats is burning contaminated waste in that incinerator, the men say, the technology exists to detect it. Lipsky explains that he wants to do a flyover of the plant and do infrared photography. Contaminated waste gives off heat. Forward-looking infrared, FLIR, will reveal whether there's anything thermally hot. The first flyover occurs in October when Building 771 is supposed to be closed. Then, on the cold nights of December 9th, 10th, and 15th, 1988, an FBI plane armed with an infrared heat sensing camera flies directly over the plant. John Lipsky, Ken Finberg, and another EPA agent are on board. Lipsky hates to fly, especially in puddle jumpers, as he gets motion sickness, but he's not thinking about his stomach. They take photos of the Building 771 incinerator, shut down by court order until February 28th, and other areas in and around the plant. Look at that, the EPA agent says, pointing to the monitor. The men can see white plumes rising from a smokestack and long white ribbons spreading out from the plant in lines, shapes, and swirls, as well as occasional white spots. White indicates thermal activity. The photos are sent to an EPA laboratory for analysis. The results are dramatic. The photographs indicate that, contrary to statements by Rockwell and the DOE, the 771 incinerator is thermally active and likely in operation, burning radioactive waste. Further, the plant appears to be illegally discharging radioactive liquid waste into Woman Creek. Streaks of light splay out from the spray fields where contaminated waste is sprayed. Narrow white rays that stretch across Indiana Street and toward Great Western Reservoir seem to indicate the movement of radioactive material beyond plant boundaries. Lipsky is shocked by the results. The heat signatures show the runoff fanning out just like a spider web. Spider web. Capillaries spread down to Woman Creek and then down to Stanley Lake, which provides drinking water for nearby cities. Even on the coldest night of their flights, when it was just seven degrees Fahrenheit, Rocky Flats was still spray irrigating with radioactive waste. Never before have two government agencies, the FBI and the EPA, planned to raid a third government agency, particularly one as powerful as the DOE. And then that leads into the um, section that's actually about uh, the raid and how they entered the plant. But you'll have to buy the book to read that part because I'm going to skip up a little bit. <laughs> but it, it is an amazingly a dramatic story. And there are a lot of heroes in this book, a lot, so many heroes in the story uh, all over the place. And um, John Lipsky and William Stone certainly are two of them, and Jim Stone. Now I'm going to skip up a little bit to uh, when I was actually working at the plant. And I have to give you a little bit of explanation here because um, I uh, was somewhat aware of what had been going on at Rocky Flats, and uh, then I um, moved to Germany, and I lived in Europe for several years. And I was living in Europe when the FBI raid happened, so I kind of missed that whole part. And I came back, and uh, I was recently divorced with two small children. I needed a job, and I opened up the newspaper, and there was a big ad, and said, Rocky Flats Environmental Technology Site. And I thought, oh, they must have fixed everything up out there. It's now environmental. Uh, <laughs> I've always wondered what went on out there. Um, so I applied for a job, and, and then I worked out there. And um, it, was, it was a very interesting place to work. I was working as an administrative assistant and um, typing up reports that were sent on to Washington. And I, I was working with a lot of material that I didn't really understand what it meant until I uh, later learned through, through research and, and interviews and all of that what these things meant. But at the time, I really did not understand uh, exactly what was going on. Um, one of the things that, that it, it, there was a great sense of camaraderie with the workers at Rocky Flats. Um, it really felt like family in a lot of ways. And I got to know uh, 
very well, some of the women that I worked with. And there were two women in particular that I got to know very well. And one of the things that we would do at lunch, we would uh, take off our high heels and go for a walk around the plant to get a little exercise. So um, this is from that particular section. And this is, uh, everything in the book, as I said, is, is um, noted in the footnotes. There are a couple of places where I have changed the names, uh, most often by request when people have asked me not to use their real names. Uh, and there are a couple of exceptions to that, but, but you can tell. And this is, um, the person that I talk about here, her name is Deborah, and this is someone uh, whose name has been changed. Deborah wears high heels at work, three inch minimum but she keeps a pair of tennis shoes under her desk. On her lunch break, if the weather is nice enough, she walks briskly around the plant for exercise, all the way down the hill, past the 300 and 700 buildings. The 700 buildings were the plutonium production buildings. With their chain link fences and razor wire, and up the other side where the buildings are more open. Join me, she says. It feels like an invitation to a secret club. On sunny autumn days, it's a breathtaking view. On one side lie the mountains, on the other a landscape dotted with houses that stretch all the way to Denver. The air is so clean here, Deborah says. It comes down right off the mountains. We catch glimpses of rabbits and groundhogs in the grass. A pair of bald eagles have been sighted near Stanley Lake. We walk past a large, flat, graveled area cordoned off with what looks like yellow police tape. A few oil barrels stand upright, and parts of, the, parts of the area are under a tent. It looks like they're preparing for a wedding or a rock concert. What's that, I ask. Oh, that, Deborah says, that's the 903 pad. And I, I just want to pause here briefly and say uh, one of the um, causes of, of uh, a great deal of contamination from Rocky Flats was an area called the 903 pad, where thousands of 55-gallon drums stood out in the open for 11 years. Uh, and the bottoms of these um, barrels rusted out and all of this radioactive and toxic contamination went down into the groundwater and the soil and then it was also picked up by the air. So this is that particular um, part of the plant where those barrels used to stand. I didn't know at that time exactly what the 903 pad was. That's the 903 pad. She walks quickly, arms moving up and down to keep her heart rate up. The thousands of barrels are gone and parts of the area are covered with gravel and asphalt. Why is it roped off? There's some plutonium that leaked out there. I reach out and touch the ribbon. I'm struck by the memory of my sister Karma and me riding our horses around the perimeter of the plant, kicking the no trespassing signs with the toes of our cowboy boots. What's the difference between one side of the ribbon and the other? Oh, we don't have to worry about that, Deborah assured me. They say this side is safe. How does the plutonium know to stay on that side of the line? It knows, plutonium doesn't travel. When I returned to my desk, Anne, the secretary who greeted me on the first day with a photo of her daughter on her desk, is ruefully watching the phone lines. I'm holding down the fort, she chirps. Everyone's still at lunch. Anne has warmed up to me too. I've also discovered that she's a little more subversive than the others. She asks whether I've been out walking and I say yes. It still feels odd to be wearing a skirt with white socks and tennis shoes, but there's no place to change clothes. A little bit of sunshine at lunch makes it easier to sit in my cubicle all afternoon. It helps keep up my energy, which has been lagging lately. A week earlier, after class at the university, I stopped in the student health center to meet with a doctor. I don't know what's wrong with me, I said. I don't feel right. I'm always tired, and it's been going on for a while. They take some blood tests. I'm still waiting for the results. Did you see any of those preble mice? Anne asks. This is a running joke in the company. Recently, the EPA started a petition to protect the tiny preble mouse, preble meadow jumping mouse, possibly the rarest small mammal in North America, which apparently likes to live in the Rocky Flats buffer zone. I guess they're too small to see, I joke. Anne's not joking. She leans forward. Here's the thing, she whispers. They're more concerned about protecting some damned rodent than they are about protecting people. There's another section um, uh, from, uh, that, well, there are a number of sections about when I worked out at Rocky Flats, but there's another kind of slightly humorous section that um, is, is in this month's Reader's Digest, actually. So if you read Reader's Digest, you can have a look and, and uh, read that section. There's a little bit more about there. 
and also a video. Reader's, Reader's Digest sent a video crew out to Rocky Flats and they shot a bunch of footage out there. So that's on, on YouTube and you can see that as well. It's really interesting. What I'd like to do now is read to you um, from the 1969 fire section. Um, a couple of things I want to say about this. There were two, as I mentioned, two big fires out at Rocky Flats, one in 1957, um, which uh, burned out um, hundreds of filters, and we will never really know exactly how much contamination got into the Denver area. They detected plutonium from Rocky Flats as far as 30 miles away. Um, and then the second devastating fire was in 1969. The two guys that I'm going to talk about here in the beginning of this chapter, Bill Dennison and Stan Skinger, two of the heroes in this book. Um, Stan Skinger was still alive when I first met with him and I got to interview him many times. And then I was also very fortunate to um, be able to rely upon the Oral History uh, Museum at the Carnegie Library, the Maria Rogers Oral History, for several wonderful interviews with Bill Dennison. Um, so uh, these are the two, and, and they're not firefighters, they were guards. They um, were going into work and they showed up at the gate and uh, found out that there was a fire going on and then they were directed directly to the plutonium processing building. I might mention that the book kind of ends um, with another fire that happened in 2003 and uh, sometimes people are surprised to discover that there was a fire out at Rocky Flats at 2003, in 2003. That was also a pretty devastating fire, not anything like this one, but it was, it was bad. And the firefighter who led the fight on that fire was Randy Sullivan, and he was a kid that I grew up with. In fact, he was my fourth grade crush. Uh, he really, and, uh, you know, but we were both too shy to talk to each other. Um, and then later, we discovered that we both worked at the plant, and then he ended up being the firefighter who fought the very last fire and was contaminated um, in that fire. So, so the book, the, fire, the theme of fire kind of runs throughout, throughout this section. I'm going to read from the part right when they are, they, um, they've just come to the gate and they've been told to uh, go down to the plutonium processing building. When they arrive on the east side of the, of the plutonium processing building, it looks quiet and clean, at least from the outside. There's a loading dock with doors on each side and a set of double doors that leads into an interior hallway. The men pull on their masks and strap on their air tanks. CO2 only, Bill says, no water. You can't use water on plutonium without risking a criticality. Stan nods. They open the door, move into the hallway, and enter the main production area. Holy cow. Stan stops in his tracks. Usually as bright as a supermarket, the room is nearly pitch black. A few emergency lights glow dully. The only noise comes from the fans, feeding a fire he can feel more than see. I can't even see my hand in front of my face, he mutters. Smoke rolls toward them in waves. Bill sees the orange glow and moves closer. It looks like the flames are shooting up over the glove boxes. One, two, three glove boxes. No, all of them. He knows the look of this kind of fire. It reminds him of forest fires he's seen in films high, fast-moving fast flames, but the color is different. It's the distinct, unearthly brilliance of burning metal. What is that, Stan yells? Plutonium, probably the magnesium carriers, too. The heat is intense. Stan feels it through his mask. It's not just the plutonium, he yells. It's the plastic, the shielding. It's the Benelux around these glove boxes. Benelux doesn't burn. It's burning. Why is it burning? The plexiglass, too, Bill shouts. The plexiglass is on fire. It takes a lot of radiant heat to make something like that flammable, Stan thinks. This fire has been going on for a while. Burning globes crash from the ceiling. It's hard to tell whether they're just light fixtures or pendants, the baskets that carry plutonium nuggets down the production line. Come on, Stan says. Time is short. He knows this building. Both men have walked it hundreds of times, upstairs and down. The two buildings are connected. The 776 side has two floors. 777 has one. Protecting the roof of 777 is crucial. The plenums, the filters, stretch across the entire roof area. Stan likes to compare a plenum to the air filter on a car. With a car, you clean the air before you pull it into the engine. 
In a plutonium processing building, you clean the air in the building before you blow it out into the atmosphere. The flow is reversed from inside to outside. If the fire burns through the plenum and the 777 roof, massive amounts of plutonium, as well as other contaminants and radioactive material, will spread over the Denver area and beyond. Stan opens a cabinet and finds a stack of hard hats. He hands one to Bill and straps one on himself. Where are the other firefighters, he wonders. They're unaware of the Jesser team. The men inch into the room until they find the buckets of sand set in corners for extinguishing small fires. They move toward the edge of the fire and throw sand on the flames. It's like throwing grains of rice in the face of an oncoming locomotive. The fire continues to grow. Bill grabs a CO2 canister and hands another to Stan. They fire them into the glove boxes. It has little effect. They empty another canister. The air in the room is unbearably hot, and the men are breathing heavily. Already, they're almost out of air. The fire gallops through the line. What now, Stan yells. Bill yells something back, but Stan can't hear it. What are they supposed to do? Who are they supposed to ask? They're alone. The no water rule is the only rule they've got, but it's useless. The men bolt out of the building, shaken and gasping. They change tanks and confer briefly, ignoring the radiation monitor, who has carefully chalked off a square area. Don't step outside these lines, he barks. Keep the contamination inside these lines, as if plutonium could possibly recognize a line of chalk. Water? Bill looks to Stan for confirmation. Water. What the hell, Stan thinks. He's not a firefighter. He's a guard. He's lived in the country, and nearly all he knows about firefighting is how to beat a prairie grass fire with a burlap sack. You good with these things, he asks Bill. More or less, Bill replies. They wrestle with the nozzle. Use the fine spray. Got it. Soft, gentle-like, Bill says. Hit the gases from the melting plastic first. See what happens. OK. They re-enter the building, this time with water hoses. We take turn, we'll take turns going forward, Bill says. I spray you, then you spray me. We need to spray each other and keep each other cooled down. Let's head toward the center, Stan says. Get under the center beams and see how the plenum looks. OK. Bill turns his hose on Stan, and Stan moves forward into the smoke, trying to follow the emergency lighting on the floor. Hey, Bill yells. Stan looks back. Don't blow any of those plutonium pieces together. Keep them separated. I know. Blue flash. He knows. Working in tandem, Bill and Stan move along the glove box line, directing a spray of water around the flames and then on each other. They've gone only a few feet when they see where the real fire lies, in the foundry area, where plutonium is melted and cast into pieces that are carried to the production line. The foundry line is 100 feet long and contains eight furnaces, all held inside glove boxes. The entire line is ablaze. Bill curses. The men glance at each other. The production area is tight. There's only one way to get to the foundry area, through the underpasses. Some glove boxes have steps beneath them, tiny stairs going down, to a miniature basement with steps leading up the other side. This allows workers to get from one side of the production line to the other. The underpasses have no drains. Anything that spills under a glove box is contaminated and has to be cleaned up, not flushed out. There's no place for the water to go, and the underpasses are filled with water. The water is rising. It's like a sheep dip, Bill says, and laughs. He thinks back to all the ranches he worked on as a kid. One hell of a sheep dip. There's our criticality, Bill, Stan says. We're looking right at it. Who's going in? Both men stand silent. Bill looks up and sees an elevator flipped upside down, the supporting metal scorched and twisted. People are going to get killed tonight, and he guesses it might be him and Stan. He thinks of his wife, who's pregnant, and his two other kids. Both men were trained for the battlefield, but it didn't prepare them for this. One thing it did teach them was to keep their feelings to themselves and move. Bill wades in. The water is up to his knees. He thinks he's moving fast, but it feels slow. He prays they haven't knocked any plutonium pits or pieces into the water, which could lead to the criticality they fear. Then he's up the other side, and the foundry fire is so hot, so immediate, that his soaked coveralls dry instantly. His face feels scorched beneath his mask. Stan is right behind him. They spray the fire until their air runs low, a few short minutes. 
Then they drop their hoses, wade through the sheep dip again, and fight their way back to the door. A radiation monitor is waiting when they burst from the building and yank off their masks. He checks their hands. You're hot, man, he barks, coated. His sharpness can't hide his fear. You can't go back in. We're all right, Bill says. No, you're off the chart. We got to go back. Stan reaches for a fresh tank. The plenum's about to go. You going to keep us out here so we can all watch the roof melt? I'm serious. You guys are not going back in that building. Who else is there, Bill asks. We're waiting on more guys, another monitor yells. We don't have anyone else yet. We don't even have enough gear. We're waiting for Boulder and Broomfield to bring more tanks. The only manager on duty that the men are aware of is the guard captain who's on the phone. Is that you, George? Stan peers into the man's mask. He recognizes him from the lunchroom. They're both model railroad hobbyists. I can't let you back in, Stan, George says. Come on, what the hell are you guys thinking? He looks toward the road. A van is on the way to take workers to building 559 for decontamination. George, Stan says, we let the fire get into the plenums and Denver is screwed. Give us the tanks, Bill's voice is furious. Can't do that. Then we'll just take them, Stan says. They strap on the tanks and pull on their masks as George, arms folded, blocks their way. Bill shoves past him, Stan follows. The men duck back into the building. I'll go first this time, Stan says, shouts. He runs, crouching, into the production line. He darts back and forth, spraying anything that doesn't look like plutonium. That man is as quick as a monkey, Bill thinks. After a few minutes, he sprays him down and they switch. Bill can't move quite as quickly as Stan, but it feels like they're making progress. They're both thinking about the roof. I'm out, Bill shouts and gestures toward his tank. Stan nods. He wonders if the heat and exertion are causing them to go through their air tanks more quickly than usual, or if the tanks are only partially filled. Abruptly, Stan is knocked to the floor. Flat on his back, covered with debris, he can't see anything. He doesn't lose consciousness, but it takes him a moment to realize that his body is covered with a heavy material, ceiling material. His heart pounds. The roof, this is it, he thinks. The roof is gone. It's over. But nothing happens. He looks up to see Bill standing. He finds he can move his arms and legs, so he sits up and looks around. He's covered with gunk, messy, sticky gunk, and he pulls a soggy piece off his arm. Bill points to a gap in the ceiling, a false ceiling made of fiber material in two foot by three foot sections. They've sprayed it repeatedly with their hoses and the tiles have collapsed from the weight of the water. Stan is covered with nothing more than soaked ceiling tiles. The roof is still intact. He stands up and Bill cleans him off. He can't read Bill's face. Outside, they explode with laughter. I hate to admit it, Stan says, but I think that's the closest I've ever come to shitting my pants. <laughs> the statement strikes them both as hilarious and they switch to new tanks. George stands back, watching. Now, meanwhile, while this is going on, there is another team coming in um, on the other side of the building. And uh, at the same time, drivers on the uh, Denver Boulder Turnpike can see the smoke from the plant. So I'm just going to read a little bit here at the end so you have a sense of how things turn out. Obviously, I, I wouldn't be here if it didn't turn out. <laughs> Bill Dennison's arms and legs are heavy with exhaustion. Stan, too, is tired. A relief crew of firefighters has arrived at the west side of the building, where Jesser and his crew are working, but there's no one to relieve the two guards. They both figure they had the last of their bad luck when the ceiling fell. They survived wading through the sheep dips. The fire, if not diminishing, at least is not growing. The worst is over, must be over, if they can just hang on a little longer. It's Stan's turn to go ahead. Their tanks are getting low, and Bill is misting Stan, keeping him cool. Stan stoops down to pick up his hose. It looks like it's charred on one side, but still usable. He turns it on, but it's too hard, too fast, and it shoots out on full, full stream. No good, he thinks. He wants to wet down the material, not blow it around. He tries to turn the valve and slow it down, but it's still too much. He shuts it all the way off, and the hose goes from full pressure to no pressure. Suddenly, the backed up water bursts through the side of the hose. It catches his mask and pulls it off. The burning air hits his face full force. The hose flails around him like a wild snake. Stan tries to think clearly. Get the mask back on, he thinks. Don't breathe. Where is the strap? The strap catches on his nose. Everything is out of place. 
Thirty seconds pass, and he's, and he's still holding his breath. His fingers fumble through the heavy gloves. Another 30 seconds. He thinks of all the crud they use in there, plastics, vinyl, rubber, paints, carbon tetrachloride, cleaning chemicals, Benelux and plexiglass, oh, and plutonium. He needs air. He can't help it. He knows he shouldn't breathe, but he has to. He takes one big gulp and holds it. He keeps holding it another minute at least until he gets the mask pulled back on. Bill pulls him around. You okay? Stan exhales into the mask and nods. I'm okay. They go back for new tanks. One more run, they think. They can do at least one more run. But Bill's bad luck isn't over yet either. The men finish their air and head for the door. As they're crossing the floor, a blazing fluorescent light fixture crashes from the ceiling, nearly knocking off Bill's hard hat. He staggers, dazed. His ox oxygen tank is empty. He can't breathe, and he's lost Stan in the smoke and the dark. A man, another guard, appears. Bill recognizes him, Charlie Parisi. He's come off the roof to help relieve Stan and Bill. Charlie's a small man, shorter than Bill, but he pulls Bill up on his shoulders and brings him out into the air. They're all contaminated. Charlie has kept his mask on, but he smells smoke, the same smoke Stan experienced, but somehow it's gotten inside his mask. The fire isn't out, but it's more or less under control, and the men stagger to the van that will take them to decon. For the citizens of Colorado, luck plays a big role on the afternoon of Mother's Day, May 11th, 1969. There are three lucky breaks, all largely the result of human error. The first stroke of luck occurred earlier in the week when workers accidentally left behind a metal plate that blocks the north glove box line. This plate forces the racing fire to turn from building 777, a single story building with an extremely vulnerable roof that probably would have collapsed immediately, to building 776. Building 776 has a second story and is a, a little less susceptible. This buys time. The second lucky break occurs when a member of Jesser's team, and that's the team that's coming in on the other side of the building, tries to hose a burning pile of plutonium into a corner. Burning plutonium turns into a heavy sludge of plutonium oxide ash, as heavy as wet cement. The pile won't move. Later, an AEC fire investigator will, will report that if the firemen had been successful in moving the sludge and pushing pieces of plutonium together, a criticality would have been the inevitable result. The third piece of luck is the most important, and it is nothing short of deja vu for Bill Dennison. Bill Dennison had fought the 1957 fire as well. A flustered fireman inadvertently backs a fire truck into a power pole adjacent to the building. Just as in 1957, an accidental power cutoff occurs, and just in the nick of time. The fans, which have been sucking the fire into the filter bank, feeding it and causing the fire, causing the roof to melt, stop spinning. The fire still burns, but more slowly, the roof holds. So um, I think I'll stop there. And I might just add, you know, when this fire was going on, it was Mother's Day, and my siblings and I, uh, my two sisters and my brother and my parents, we were out having Mother's Day brunch, like many people uh, in the area, and we had no idea that this was going on. And, um, and it was, it, it, we were not warned, and, and we were not told about it. But this was a very important fire because um, after this point, uh, there was a big investigation, and there was uh, some coverage in the media, and it was at that point that the DOE um, admitted that there was plutonium contamination off-site. And, and here's the surprising thing about that, that most of that contamination did not come from this 1969 fire, but it came, in fact, from the 1957 fire and uh, from these oil barrels that were uh, leaking into the ground that I mentioned earlier. Um, so anyway, May 11th, 1969. So I think I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. Thank you. Do you have questions? <laughs> The cleanup has been very controversial, and we could talk quite a long time about that. Um, but uh, uh, as many of you um, know, uh, 1,300 acres of the site are, are profoundly contaminated and will never, probably never be able to be open for human use. And the rest of the site, roughly 4,000 acres, is slated to open as a uh, wildlife refuge for hiking and biking and, and public recreation. At this point in time, it's still closed. 
Um, and, uh, but there's quite a bit of development going on, certainly, around the site. So, question? Yes. Oh, oh well, actually, I, I called on her first, and then you. Go ahead. You? Stan and Bill are not still alive. Um, they both, uh, uh, Stan uh, died of mesothelioma, and um, Bill uh, passed away from cancer. Um, but it took a while, you know, for both of them, and um, Stan, uh, Bill worked out at Rocky Flats for quite a long time after that point, and um, Stan worked out there for a short period of time and decided to um, leave uh, Rocky Flats and take up another line of work. One kind of neat thing about um, Stan Skinger, and he, uh, he had uh, been a volunteer at the Denver Botanical Gardens, and they named uh, Lily after him when he passed away. So there's a scan Stan Skinger Lily at the Denver Botanical Gardens. So anyway, yes? Good evening. Uh, I worked at Rocky Flats for 37 years. A good part of it is a uh, radiation control technician. Mm -hmm. I carry a 36 uh, rad uh, plutonium long burden. And uh, I worked on uh, area 903, the barrel pad. I worked on the 76 building fire cleanup. But my mission tonight is not to impress you with what I did or didn't do. It's to ask your ongoing support for the over 2,000 sick and dead workers and their families uh, that are attempting to find answers and closure for their occupational exposures. And you've had uh, some notoriety, and I would ask your pledge to help these, uh, these sick and wounded uh, people to find uh, justice. Mm -hmm. uh, there are over uh, 7,000 claims still waiting for mm -hmm. adjudication. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave you a copy of the, uh, the report that uh, the yeah. Department of Labor mm -hmm. filed yesterday. Mm -hmm. So uh, you got to mm -hmm. know that your story is just one of thousands. Sure. And every time a worker became sick or uh, had died as a result of their occupational exposure. It was a tragedy in that household. Mm -hmm. And the stories go on and on and mm -hmm. on, and probably will for many years in the future. Mm -hmm. So I would ask that we would uh, ride on your coattails. Mm -hmm. You know, you're kind of a shooting star here. I don't you know, know about that. But yeah. And, uh, well, we have a lot of people that are anxiously awaiting. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you so much for bringing this up. And, and I might mention, in fact, just today I finished an op-ed. Um, th there are a number of things on the table right now. Um, so many workers who have not received compensation at Rocky Flats and at other nuclear facilities around the country. There were 13 other nuclear weapons facilities around the country, and many of them have similar issues, although in some ways Rocky Flats is the worst. There are a couple of other things on the table right now. Uh, one is that um, there is support um, in the Congress to build a new uh, pit production facility at Los Alamos that would be capable of producing up to 450 pits per year. When pit production ended at Rocky Flats uh, in the early 1990s, it was eventually picked up by Los Alamos, but they have um, only been able to produce a couple of two to three uh, pits per year. Um, and now there's uh, interest in, this has been for a while, um, for, that to, uh, for that to start up again. And it's an interesting thing to me with, with all of these things going on in the nuclear weapons industry and, and nuclear power. And I think in a campaign year, uh, many of our politicians are not really wanting to talk about these kinds of things. And I know that uh, many of the workers last week were at a rally for Mitt Romney here in Colorado. I don't want to get political here too much, but it's interesting what's going on. And they were not allowed to bring their signs in. And that yet once they got inside, they saw that lots of people had signs, and they were the only group that were not allowed to bring their signs in. So this truly is an unrecognized uh, group of people. And the other rec unrecognized group, I have to tell you, is, is all the people who grew up around Rocky Flats. I have known so many stories of people that I knew, that I grew up with, um, people who have had illnesses in their families. Uh, one of the people that I write about in my book is Tamara Meza, just an incredible story. They were just right down the road from us. And the only difference between them and us really was that they had a well that went right down into the water table. It was a Mormon family and they lived off the land. They had their own garden and uh, cattle and horses. And, um, 
and they've had a lot of illness in their family, and, and Tamara, Tamara Mesa has had many surgeries for uh, brain tumors. She's another hero in my book, one of the strongest, most remarkable people I've ever met. There's been a lot of illness. Even just since this book came out, this book has only been out for about a week, I have been flooded with emails from people who live around Rocky Flats or used to live around Rocky Flats, people who are sick or have had sick illness and cancers in their families, and they ask me, where can we go? What can we do? There has never been any public health monitoring for people living around Rocky Flats. Um, now at Fernald, for example, there was a successful class action lawsuit and, you know, there was some help for the citizens there. I don't have anything to tell people when they, when they call me or send me their stories. I don't know where to send them, but there are a lot of stories out there. It's, it's, just, it's remarkable. Yes? Was it difficult for you to find the right tone for this book with such a, a huge story and a heated issue and so many people affected? Yeah. Rocky Flats is an incredibly emotional issue for so many people, for the workers, for the activists, for the residents, the people involved in the class action lawsuit, the attorneys. One of the attorneys that I write about in my book who is a big part of the class action lawsuit is Peter Norberg. His story is incredible. Um, very emotional. And it took me a long time to write this book for a lot of reasons, but one reason was that I really had to um, get my heart and mind around the whole story and do as much research as I possibly could. And as I was writing the book, um, in my office I had three narrative lines going across the wall. One was um, the history of the story of Rocky Flats. One was the story of my family and everything that happened to us and, and neighbors and pe you know the personal side of the story. And then the other line was the history of the Cold War because this really is a Cold War story. Um, I mentioned that I, I had been living in Germany for several years and I wanted to watch the wall come down. And I came back to the States just right before that happened. Uh, so I wasn't able to see it in person. I had to watch it on television. I was watched on television and it, it occurred to me at that moment, a uh, light bulb went off, so like, oh my God, the Cold War has been happening here in my own backyard, quite literally. And so one of the great ironies of my life is I spent a lot of time trotting around the planet looking for good things to write about. <laughs> and it turned out that it was quite literally in my own backyard. But I wanted to fully and adequately represent all of the stories of Rocky Flats. I did not write this book with an agenda, any agenda in mind or a certain polemic or anything like that. I wanted to tell a story that I felt was very important and should not be forgotten. And, um, and so that's the approach that I took and I, I talked to as many people as I could and people were, people, people talked to me, people told me their stories and there was just a tremendous amount um, of research available and more and more became available as I, as I you know, continue with my research and after Hazel O'Leary, then Secretary, Energy Secretary, you know, they released a lot of information and so it, it took me a long time to pull it together but I really wanted it to be a, um, a fair and, and objective telling of the story, but I think it's also a very emotional story. I wanted to thank you for writing the book because I did see it before it was um, available, so oh. <laughs> online. Oh. And um, I noticed that you referenced Mayak in Russia. Uh -huh, right. uh, that also had a criticality accident in 1957, so we yeah. were contaminated all over the place. Yeah. And I don't know what your controversy, if there is one with this or not. Uh -huh. And then, of course, um, Vincent uh, Carroll, I, he wrote a, a criti um, criticism of your book, and mm -hmm. I, in turn, took this copy and wrote to Hazel O'Leary at Fisk University, eight pages. Uh -huh. And um, at the end of it, it says, it didn't happen because Governor Romer said it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, two things I want to say to that just very briefly. Um, one is, is the whole uh, idea of MIAC, which is fascinating. And I have not been to MIAC, but I hope I think I hope I get to go there someday. Uh, but Mayak was really the sister city of Rocky Flats, and they were, in Russia, they were doing the same thing at Mayak they, that we were doing at Rocky Flats, except that they were a little bit bigger and they had some nuclear reactors out there as well. And there was incredible contamination there. And what's interesting is that they had lots of accidents and very similar you know, to what happened here in the States. And uh, it's interesting to think about the idea uh, I don't know how y'all will feel about this, but in some ways people were more aware of what was happening at Mayak in Russia than we were aware here in Colorado of what was happening at Rocky Flats. 
So, yeah. The other thing I want to say just real quick, um, when Romer, when you talk about Romer, his story is, is amazing, Governor Romer. There were many people who uh, did know to a certain extent what was going on or were caught off guard in certain instances. And one of the people in the book whom I really admire is Mark Silverman, who was a manager at Rocky Flats when I was working out there. Um, the night I came home, um, one night from work, picked up my two kids, gave them their baths, put them to bed, came downstairs to have a cup of TV, a cup of tea, turned on the TV, and um, there was Mark Silverman on the television on a nightline. And it was, it's an incredible nightline show. And that was the first time, and I was working at the plant, that's the first time that I had any inkling of what was really going on. That there was 14 tons of plutonium out there, much of it unsafely stored. And um, Mark Silverman was one, one of the things that he said is that we have done, uh, I think we've done too good a job of telling people how safe Rocky Flats is. And we need people to be involved and we need people to protest and make noise because that's how people, how their representatives can go to Washington and make things happen. So he was, he was very upfront about all of that and I had a lot of, a lot of respect for him. Yes? A couple of questions. Uh, the 1969 Mother's Day fire were, were plans ever made, or was it talked about to evacuate the metro Denver area when that fire happened, or it just happened too fast? Were there any contingency plans that were in place? And then I believe Governor Dick Lamb ordered and Tim Worth ordered a report, and what was your response to that? Uh, what, what, any comments about that? The Lamworth report. Uh, the Lamworth report um, recommended that Rocky Flats be closed or moved, and none, none of those, uh, neither of those options were um, pursued at the time for a number of reasons. But it's an excellent report and very interesting reading, and it's available on the uh, on the internet um, actually. Um, and uh, repeat the first part of your question again. Uh, when the Mother's Day fire of 1969 uh, happened, were there actually any evacuation plans that were ready to be implemented, or did the fire happen too fast that nobody really thought there, about that? Uh, an, evacu an evacuation plan had been discussed for years and had been on the table for years, and um, it never was put through. It, it, at every point, it was scuttled. Um, there was, uh, for a time, an advisory notice for residents out by Rocky Flats. When my parents bought their house, they had to sign a notice that said, um, there is plutonium contamination here in the soil, and we want you to be aware of it, but it is at a, a level that is safe for residents. And the government will tell us if, um, if there's any real danger. So, uh, and my parents thought they were raising their kids in the perfect environment. They didn't give it a second thought. Um, that advisory notice was in place for a while, um, and, uh, um, and then it was rescinded uh, when Reagan came into office. And I just want to mention, I'm kind of keeping an eye on the time here, but I want to mention very briefly the story of Carl John Johnson, who was health director uh, for Jefferson County. Um, and uh, one of the things that, first things that he did, what, something that came up on his desk was they wanted to build uh, houses on contaminated sto soil out by Rocky Flats. And uh, he initiated a number of studies. Um, and said, why are we building houses on contaminated land? He opposed development. And for opposing that development, he eventually lost his job. He did win a whistleblower lawsuit um, after that, but uh, I think, it, at least in my neighborhood, and the way it was talked about in the neighborhood was, you know, he's crazy. How could the land, how could, how could the land be contaminated? How could our government put us at risk without telling us the, you know, without telling us? So. One last question. Do you mm -hmm. think the wildlife refuge is safe and would you go out there? Well, that's a big question. I, <laughs> I would be very careful about going out there myself. I think that there is evidence, including um, recent off-site testing that supports um, plutonium contamination going back to the 1970s at the same levels as testing done by the AEC. Um, and uh, there is a risk of breathable particles of plutonium out there, and there's still 
uh, a great deal of contamination on site. And then there are also other types of contamination that people don't really talk about. An enormous amount of carbon tetrachloride, for example, was released into the environment and other, other um, things like that. So I think, this is what I think. I think that we should have full disclosure and I think people should be aware um, if they're going to go out to Rocky Flats, to the wildlife refuge, or buy, buy a house in that immediate vicinity, they should be aware that there was a nuclear weapons plant out there and be aware of what happened. And uh, I think there's a lot of effort in the past. Um, it was because of Cold War secrecy and other reasons. Um, but the story has been hidden from us for so many reasons for so long, and I think that's continuing uh, to a certain extent to the present day. Um, in Colorado, people want to build houses and buy houses and build shopping malls and move on with their lives. And, and uh, we don't want to think about what happened there and what still remains, what the legacy of that story is. And I think it's a story that we, that we need to remember. You and then, let's see, I got somebody here. One more. How would you define the borders of the immediate vicinity? In, your, in, in the last comment you just made. Oh, okay, okay. Well, there are a number of really good. There are a number of really good maps, and some of them. Um, and these are maps that are produced by the Department of Energy, uh, and then earlier maps by the AEC. Uh, and some of them are available on the web. Some of them are available on my website. There are other organizations um, that have uh, information available, so you can look on there and see. So. One, one more, one more. Uh, <laughs> these two people have been very present. Two, two more, very quick, but you have to be very quick. Yes. I wanted to make uh, two comments. Uh, the, the thing about the mass evacuation, I don't know your awareness, but we were the only facility in the complex that made the, the components uh, that the, the Department of Defense said that they needed. We were back in production in a matter of less than six months, and the emphasis was to, uh, to clean up uh, what they called the cafeteria line. In regard to uh, whether or not the place is safe, I don't know your awareness, but they dropped uh, some of the major buildings on their footprints and covered them with the dirt. Yeah. And if they were buried below a certain uh, number of inches, uh, they were exempt from any of the environmental uh, contamination limits. So you got to know that the stories go on and on and on, and none of us know it all. But uh, the thing I'm wanting is uh, that, uh, that there would be uh, good science and good sense, and unfortunately that's uh, in short supply. And uh, we also have this uh, number of people that are withering and dying that I think uh, deserve uh, stronger attention than the government has uh, devoted so far. <coughs> So you got to know that we're going to have people uh, have problems and health issues uh, way past my, my lifetime. Uh, they estimated one time the last of uh, the workers would be dead somewhere around the year 2060. Yeah, it will go on for a while. And I might just mention very briefly in terms of, with respect to the contamination levels at Rocky Flats, the top three feet of soil allow 50 picocuries per gram of soil of plutonium. The next three feet is 1,000 picocuries per gram or higher. And then below six feet, there is no limit. Even though most of these buildings had pipes and basements and many of them went deep down into the ground. Um, so that's still there, you know, <laughs> a lot of it. Much of it has been consolidated. Some of it is capped. Um, but a lot of people have said uh, we need to keep it closed and cap it and then pray it doesn't move. That's what Wes McKinley says, pray it doesn't move. <laughs> but it moves, you know, all the groundhogs out there are digging around and there's a lot of wind and rain. And there, there's something else that needs to be added to this. We need to prevent this from occurring at any other location in the, in the U.S. Uh, they didn't uh, quit making weapons, they merely moved them to other locations. And uh, all we're going to do is subject a new group of people and a new environment to the same blight that has uh, befallen Rocky Flats and, and the inhabitants. So I'm interested in uh, this being a learning experience where we say, hey, this was a disaster and we don't want it to happen again. So I'd ask your, uh, your support and cooperation on that again.
And here is the connection to nuclear power plants, just very briefly, because we had, you know, people say, oh, nuclear weapons, nuclear power, two separate issues. There are some similarities, um, some very important similarities. One thing we have to deal with the waste. Um, the other thing is, can we count on full disclosure on the part of government and corporations to let us know when they are putting us at risk? <laughs> And, you know, um, and then the other thing is the myth of absolute safety. Uh, you know, can we say with absolute certainty, this place is safe, which is a line of argument that a lot of people find very appealing about nuclear power plants right now and all of the aging nuclear power plants around the country. So there's some very important similarities between these two issues. One more question. I know we're out of time. I just want to know, would, do you, would you continue to live here? Because I've learned that this code of silence after living here for 20-something years and the criticality plume that blew all the way up Highway 85 to Greeley. And I live out in Henderson, and I want to move out of this state. <laughs> well, briefly, I'll just say, you know, I, I live in Memphis now. I've lived all over the place. But my heart and soul are in Colorado. I love it here. I grew up in this land. I think it's the most beautiful state on, on the planet. <laughs> I really love it here. And I think it's a great irony, and I think it's a great travesty that we have poisoned our own nest. And the very least that we can do is be honest about what happened and try to make better decisions in the future. Okay, one more. <laughs> well, you know, you know, there's quite a push going on to, to connect the dots on the, the circular loop around, around the area, you know, by connecting 36 to Highway 36 to 93 down by Golden, which would involve cutting through a portion of that Rocky Flats land and disturbing all that to, to build highway. Now, how do you feel about that, and do you think it should be done? Um, I'm not in favor of the Jefferson Parkway, and I think that even the development that's going on out there now is stirring up a lot of, of, of dust and stirring up a lot of stuff. The thing with development is, um, you know, whatever roads we put through out there make it all the more easier for 7-Elevens and King Supers and strip malls, and you know, and we can put a shopping mall on top of it, but plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. You know, it's, it's not going to go away. So, I, you know, I, I do think that we should be very, very careful about any development that goes on at all out there. That's my personal opinion. Okay, thank you.